Hey everybody, how's it going? Um, welcome back to another week. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the light week last week with just having lecture readings to get through and not actually having to sit here and uh, watch my mug grown on and on and on. This week we're going to be talking about um, kind of like the history of physical education, history of kinesiology inside the United States. It's kind of one of those important topics that we kind of have to talk about in order to figure out one, where we've been, but also kind of start to develop where we're going, where you want to take the field yourself and really help not repeat a couple of mistakes that have been done, um, but also to kind of carry on kind of that, that tradition rich environment that we're going to have. So with that being said, let's get going. Realistically, what we need to know is that this field, right, like the field of kinesiology is super old technically, right? So it wasn't until not that long ago that we actually started studying the science of human movement, right? So the field of kinesiology is younger than it really actually is. And what I mean by that is if you go all the way back to ancient civilizations, you can go back to the ancient Romans, the ancient Greek, the ancient Mayas. Essentially, what we had going on was physical training. We had a, we had a calculated and dedicated approach to physical training in order to improve, improve military um, prowess, right? Like we, we were trying to optimize the soldier, optimize the warfighter and optimize uh, kind of the, the nation's strength based on the military. And really, one that, that kind of hasn't changed across multiple millennia, but what we were really chasing down was this military relevant training or this physical based tra um, training. And the, essentially the goal for those ancient civilizations was to become a citizen soldier. And like, that's what the Greeks wanted. That's what the Romans wanted. It's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon, right? Like, so a lot of our biggest tech booms in recent era have come from wartime engineering. It's a similar thing going on here, Like right? We were trying to optimize the human for war early. Kind of what became of that is we started to transform some of that, that wartime or warrior mentality and transition it into sport. So what you'll see as you move through your kinesiology classes is that there's kind of two different levels here. Like we have a health and a fitness and we have a sport. That sport kind of takes things to the next level. It's, it's where physical fitness actually starts getting applied and it starts becoming athleticism. In, in ancient time, we started getting professional athletes and athletes would actually sell services. Athletes would actually be paid in order to compete and paid based on their physical prowess and their athletic abilities. And during this time, we actually started to see the boom of the original gyms, right? So like people were out there browing out, hitting, hitting some lifts early in the, like early in history, early in human history, because it's, it was a place of social gathering. Not only was it a place of social gathering, but it also became kind of like a philosophical hotspot. And these gymnasiums were used for kind of enhancing the body as well as the mind at the same time, which is not all too different than it is now, except now it's usually a lot more grunting and huffing and puffing for sharing of philosophical ideas. <laughs> so if you flash forward from ancient Roman times, ancient Greek times in mind and all that, all the way to the 1500s, if, if you know anything about history, then you know in the 1500s, religion basically dominated everything. And what was basically done here is that we we began to separate out, humans began to separate out physical activity, health, fitness, sport, and religion. Essentially, the Protestant sects, so anything that was non-Catholic, right, basically came up with this concept that anything that you did above and beyond health-based activities actually was not okay. Exercising for health was okay, but any time that you took that level just a little bit too far and you actually started moving it into sport, it was actually ungodly. And, and the strive was to achieve godliness, not necessarily fitness. So it's kind of a shift away from these, these hot spots for philosophical discussion and for physical fitness of the gymnasiums of Roman and Greek times and more towards a religious driven sect. Now I told you guys at the beginning of this that we we're gonna be focusing mainly on American physical education and really on 
what North American uh, kinesiology has kind of looked like over the years. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing. So it really wasn't until the 1820s that physical education actually started to, to make an appearance inside the Americas. Of course, during this, like before this, we were, we were establishing the, the continent essentially, right? Like during this, this time beforehand, we weren't necessarily just focused on physical fitness or physical education, but more survival. And then it wasn't until 1823 that we actually get the first ever kind of private secondary school physical education program. Now, physical education might have been a part of a program before informally, but this is when it was actually integrated into the curriculum associated with the school, which is really kind of a cool concept, right? But again, this is just private school, so it's one school doing one thing. It wasn't until 1855, some 32 years later, that physical education was actually offered into public school systems. So it took 30 two years of physical education being in curriculums at private secondary schools before it was introduced into public schools. It's kind of crazy to think about, especially since essentially there's like an assault on PE and physical education now in the school systems. So the next couple slides, we're going to be talking about important figures and important people in the physical education and the kinesiology world um, as it relates to American physiology. So Catherine Beecher is, is really an interesting woman, and she was She's really well known for being one of the first to actively struggle to essentially establish that physical education curriculum. So she she was actually fighting tooth and nail to bring that physical education into curriculum and make it a part of daily activity, not just something that was tangentially related to what was going on. And it's kind of interesting that she plays such a huge role in the history of physical education because truthfully, the field of physical education and, and really kinesiology in general and has been almost sex defined or gender defined or, or whatever, however you want to define it, right? Women have had a, a lesser spot in, in the history of physical education. And it was believed for the longest time, there was essentially this like negative feeling about how women should be in higher education or, or should not be is a better way of putting there. And they also believed that women shouldn't be physically active because it created a non-ladylike phenotype or it, it allowed for non-ladylike attire. As you guys know from when we were talking about the myths associated with physical education and physical activity and, and weight training and all that associated with women, this is baloney, right? Like this is bogus. There should not be these this deviation. Well, we can't go back and change history, but this is one of those things where by knowing where the field has been, we need to know how we can push it forward. So it's this is actually one reason why there's a lot of female research that hasn't been done, a lot of physical education and physical fitness research on women that hasn't been done yet. It's kind of been propagated throughout the years, which is disgusting. So Dr. Lewis, continuing on with these important people, Dr. Lewis kind of took some of those Catherine Beecher ideas, and then he actually started the first physical education teacher training in schools, and he started it in the United States. It's really a cool concept. So he was essentially the first PE teacher teacher, right? Like he was the first person to actually begin educating future physical education specialists. Dr. Hitchcock was really the first official or formal um, physical educator, or PE teacher at the collegiate level. Not only is he credited with being such a, such a pivotal individual in bringing higher education into the, into the new era and bringing physical education forward into the college arena or the higher education arena, he also began using anthropometrics. And what anthropometrics are is essentially it's, it's trying to use quantitative techniques to identify traits associated with humans. So what he started doing was essentially exercise science. He was using uh, girth measurements to check like chest girth, arm, height, weight, uh, everything, trying to essentially find the ideal college male. So he was really starting down a research line in exercise science. And you can see that he came from physical education here in the United States. It's really like, regardless of your field in kinesiology, we all have these roots in physical education. It's why it's such an important concept to talk about. Moving right along, we're going to have Dr. Sargent. Sargent's kind of a cool, Dr. Sargent's kind of a really interesting individual to me because 
he, he was an inventor of exercise equipment. And I'll show you the next slide. We're going to actually have a couple of pictures associated with um, Dr. Sargent's equipment. But you can, you can tell by looking at the slides, he was into doing a lot of things. So he was an assistant professor of physical training at Harvard, uh, which, is, which is really interesting. He was a director of a gym, right? So he was just an old school bro. Like, look at him. I mean, you could tell the dude could squat some weight. But what you'll see is that a lot of his designs, if, if you start looking into some of his designs, you'll see that they've carried forward. And he was really a pioneer for exercise equipment. Before this, everything was really based on gymnastics and everything was really based on um, more plyometrics and body weight ac activity and calisthenics. Good Lord, I was searching for that word for a while, right? So he really started to introduce how we could have an external load applied so that we could actually lift weights, right? So that we could actually be lifting and not just doing calisthenics. So if you look here, you can see one of the, uh, one of the sergeant machines. And he actually invented this pulley system that looked like a low row. And so it's, it's somewhere between a combination of a rowing ergometer and a low row. So you are actually able to get quite a bit of resistance, um, on, on the row, but you could also do a chest workout with this same pulley based system. So he was really essentially creating the first resistance training machines. Kind of think about that next time you're in there in the gym lifting. It's, it's, it's really cool. So Dr. Hannah is, is, was a pioneer for, for women's physical activity and women's physical education. She was actually the first instructor in physical education at Oberlin College um, all the way back to 1885, and she was responsible for establishing the first four-year bachelor's degree for physical education for women specifically. So she was, she was kind of pioneering this, this women's rights or women's usefulness. That's a terrible word. These women's... Uh, ability to participate in physical education and learn physical education and become future physical education instructors. Dr. Anderson is very similar, except what he did is rather than creating a four-year institution or four-year bachelor's program, he actually was doing a full dedicated summer training for physical educators. So he was, he was helping to pioneer some of the original physical education training that was occurring. But significantly more important than Dr. Anderson's kind of approach to physical education training in the summer is he actually founded the Association for the Advancement of Physical Education in 1885. And what what the American Associ what the Association of the Advancement of Physical Education has become is the American Alliance for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dancer APERD. This is the major organization when it comes to physical education. It is like what would be the 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 New England Journal of Medicine to medicine. It would be the American College of Sports Medicine to kinesiology. It, it is a massive, massive association, and Dr. Anderson's responsible for really founding it and getting it up and off the ground. From 1885 to 1900, so bringing it forward another 15 years, what, what they were pr predominantly worried about was anthropometrics, so measuring of humans and trying to determine ideal sizes and, and ratios and girths, to, to also the battle of the systems. And the battle of the systems is basically talking about how we were using physical education. Were we using German gymnastics? Were we using Swedish gymnastics? Were we using the sergeant machines? Were we using something else? So it, it actually came down to what was going to be the best approach for physical education moving forward, as well as what was one of the best systems out at that time to actually improve physical fitness of individuals. If you flash forward 27 years from 1900 to 1927, you're going to see the institution of, you're going to see the kind of the birth and actually the termination of the Harvard Fatigue Lab. Now, the Harvard Fatigue Lab is the most prolific and really probably the, like the most, um, most interesting research laboratories that have ever existed in exercise physiology. It was the who's who's of exercise physiology research at the time, there was some amazing, amazing, amazing researchers that were here at the time during this 1927 to 1947. You'll learn about them. I mean, it was A.V. Hill, D.B. Dill. There was some really amazing individuals working here. And what they 
what they were responsible for is essentially being the first laboratory for comprehensive study of the man. So they were doing everything from nutrition research to exercise research to fatiguing exercise. They fasted people for like 40 days just to see what would happen. It was amazing. And this is really the birthplace of exercise physiology research in America. Some of the big things that came out of these, these new associations and these new research labs was the need for physical fitness testing, right? And there's been tons of iterations of physical fitness testing over the years. But what essentially came about in 1980 from APERD was a health-related physical fitness test. So we're not looking at sport-related. We're not looking at athleticism. We're looking at health. So we're looking at cardiorespiratory fitness, muscular strength, body fatness, all the different things that are actually components of physical health for an individual. So in 1980, APERD released these, this, this series of tests that you could do to determine someone's health. It was body composition using skin folds, which is what you can see in this top right picture. Essentially what you do is you pinch different levels of fat across the body to see how thick the fat is, and you're looking to see approximate body fatness. They introduced a cardiorespiratory fitness test, which was a one and a half mile or 12 minute run. These were field tests that could be done without the use of expensive laboratory equipment. We also introduced the muscular strength and endurance, which was a bent knee sit up. So most of you guys have done bent knee sit ups. I'm sure all of you, unless you're super into CrossFit now where it's straight leg sit ups or butterfly sit ups where you're like feet are touching, um, right? Like we're, we're very familiar with this. And then flexibility as well was introduced with a with a straight leg or sit and reach approach. Now, this looks very similar to the presidential fitness test that I'm sure all of you guys had to go through as you're going through elementary school. So if in 1980, we establish a series of fitness tests to determine the health of an individual, it would become, it, would, it, it should start to become a little bit obvious that health and fitness should play a role in medicine. And the problem is that it hasn't always been that way. Medicine hasn't always embraced exercise science. Medicine hasn't always embraced physical education or, or really the use of movement to improve health. So what we, what we really see is that in the kinesiology field, we all kind of share that view that exercise is a drug. Exercise should be able to help fitness and help health of individuals. Right, like this is the reason why physical therapists have jobs. It's the reason athletic trainers, exercise physiologists, physical educators, all of us have jobs is because we all believe in and people believe that exercise is actually medicine. So the problem is that until the early 1900s, physical education was just dominated by physicians specializing in health and exercise science. But as we transitioned, right? Like as we moved away from physical fitness and towards sports prowess, that essentially created this like focus on, on exercise for performance and not exercise for health. So all of your exercise, all of your physical activity was basically dedicated to competition and athletic achievement, not necessarily trying to improve your fitness and trying to improve your health. And so what we, what we actually had historically what we've had with medicine, what we've had with physicians is actually that preservation and promotion of health and a prevention of disease. We've actually transitioned and we're trying to transition back, but we've, we've essentially transitioned away from this preventative approach, this health and, and kind of holistic approach to health towards sick care where doctors are prescribing medicine to combat sickness and we're, we're trying to combat illness rather than prevent illness. So what exercise as medicine is really talking about is how can we combine diet with sleep patterns, with physical activity, with movement to, to try to actually prevent disease, promote health. Because if we don't do that, we're, what we're going to end up with is essentially what the current state of the United States is, which is disease, illness, obesity, diabetes, right? Like you name it, we've got it because we've kind of transitioned, unfortunately, away from this preventative care and towards a sick care. And we've moved away from physical fitness and away from physical education towards other concepts. So exercise as medicine is trying to really reverse this. So as we walk into the 1960s, what you're going to see is really the birth and the flourishing of the American College of Sports Medicine. We start to get physicians joining the American College of Sports Medicine and, and trying to bring exercise into, 
and into the forefront of concepts that are going to be discussed for physicians. Now, the problem is that physicians do not receive formal training on exercise. Physicians do not receive formal training on nutrition. It's something that they just flat out don't do. So what we have to be working towards is creating an umbrella of care underneath the kinesiology umbrella, right? Like we need to be working together as co-practitioners where we have someone practicing medicine as well as someone practicing exercise, someone practicing diet, and really creating this this consortium of, of exercise or a consortium of medical professionals trying to improve the health of individuals. So if we flash forward from 1960 with kind of the flourishing of exercise as medicine and ACSM, we're going to get in 1979, the U.S. Surgeon General actually announces an assault on diet or an assault on chronic disease. And the way that they recommend assaulting, or I guess that's a terrible way of putting it, the way that they actually recommend combating this, this chronic disease is by using diet and exercise. But it wasn't really until 2007 that we get a mutual sponsorship from the CDC and the, the federal government with the American College of Sports Medicine to create the concept and really... Um, term the phrase and and start to develop the programs associated with exercise as medicine. What I want you guys to be doing this week as you're working through your assignment is I want you to be thinking about how does your plan moving forward in the healthcare field or not, or moving forward in the kinesiology field, how does it relate to what's happened in the past? How does the how does what people have done in the past apply to what you're trying to do now? How is what you're trying to do now going to propel the field into the future, right? I know it's a little bit more pensive, but by doing this, you can start to appreciate where you're trying to get to um, and kind of bring somewhat full circle all the way back to when we were talking about our resumes. What are our goal resumes, right? So get on to it, and I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks.